Okay, so in today's class, uh, I'm going to discuss uh, another topic, and that is the solution of uh, Maxwell's equation using Green's functions. So you see, this technique of Green's function appears repeatedly in many applications in physics. So it's worthwhile to know what uh, Green's functions are. So specifically, Green's functions basically uh, always allow you to uh, know the solution at some other point if you know the solution at some given point. So basically it's like a propagator. So it also appears in some other context later on when we discuss multi-particle systems where the number of particles is not conserved. So, but the defining characteristics of Green's function is that they obey a certain equation which is uh, very generic and uh, that equation is basically of the form uh, that is described here uh, which is uh, 3.150. So, uh, T is some operator which can, uh, I have chosen it to depend upon a maximum of two special space time derivatives. So, it could involve time or only space. Uh, so, bottom line is that uh, usually in applications in physics, uh, the operators that we consider are at most uh, second order. So, uh, the idea is that uh, we have to learn how to solve these types of equations. But more generally what will happen is that uh, in uh, applications you will find that uh, the uh, solution that we seek for some uh, say this is uh, this could be for example the potential uh, of uh, some charge distribution or it could be basically the, f the four vector potential that is the scalar and the vector potential combined of some electromagnetic field and F could be some source term. Right. So, you, you could have sources of the electromagnetic field and this would correspond to the D Almersian operator in that case. So, typically uh, that would be the case in electrodynamics. In electrostatic, this would be just the Laplacian and the right hand side would be either the charge density if you are talking about electrostatics or the current density if you are talking about magnetostatics. So, bottom line is that see the Green's function technique basically allows you to uh, know the answer to this question that is it allows you to find the answer for u of x um, but then to find the u of x it is easier uh, many times to solve uh, a generic equation which is called the Green's function equation. So the idea is here is that see the sources uh, can keep changing. So you see the point is that you can replace the given set of sources by some other set of sources it is very inconvenient to repeatedly keep solving this equation this 3.149 again and again just because you have changed the source to something else. So what is the more convenient is to solve uh, basically uh, the solution for a point source uh, but then located at some arbitrary point. So that means you imagine a point source that that is located at some point called x dash and then you find out your you know the answer you are looking for for that point source. But the claim is that because these equations are going to be linear in the unknown which is uh, u, u of x, because it is linear you can always uh, add up all the uh, sources. So if you have a charge distribution rather than a point charge then you can just go ahead and uh, construct the charge distribution as basically the sum of uh, lots of point charges with appropriate weights. So as a result uh, your uh, solution will also be a summation of the answers for the corresponding answers for the point charge with the appropriate weight. So that is exactly what this is. So 3.151 basically tells you that the answer you are looking for u of x is basically the uh, summation or in this particular case the integration. So this is f of x is your weight so that uh, so this would be correspond to the weight of the delta function. So this is your Green's function for the point charge. So the answer for the uh, charge distribution F is given by the answer for the point charge multiplied by the charge distribution summed over all the locations where the charge distributions are found which is X dash. So this is basically the power of the Green's function technique that is you do not have to repeatedly solve for uh, your unknown which is U of X uh, every time you change your source which is F of X. Okay. So uh, having said that uh, let me go ahead and give you some uh, more specific examples so that was very general. 
So, uh, a more specific example would be um, say in electrostatics it would correspond to solving say the Poisson equation. So, you have the Poisson equation which is del squared phi equals minus 4 pi rho and the solution to this is clearly uh, based upon what we just discussed. It is phi of x is minus 4 pi integral over all the locations where the sources are present which is rho of x dash times the Green's function of the, so the remember what the Green's function is, it is the, uh, it is the solution of the potential when there is a point source located as x dash. So, it is the solution of the potential at uh, position x when there is a point source at x dash. So, that is exactly what this is. So, similarly uh, this is uh, what I just told you is electrostatics. But then you can also do something very analogous uh, for the case of magnetostatics. So, instead of the scalar potential in magnetostatics you have to replace by vector potential and instead of charge density you have current density. So, it is pretty much the same thing mathematically there is no difference. Okay. So, you can also combine these two and I can talk about electrodynamics where you have both uh, scalar and vector potentials together and they influence each other. In that case uh, you should be talking about the four vector you know the four vector potential. So, that means the time component would correspond to the scalar potential and the space components would correspond to the vector potential. So, put together that could correspond to a four vector and J mu is basically the four vector current. So, that would correspond to charge density and current density and A0 would correspond to scalar potential and A1, A2, A3 would correspond to the components of the vector potential. So, like I told you just like uh, you can write down the solution uh, for the Poisson equation in terms of the Green's function even for this uh, wave equation with a source you can still do the same thing except now this Green's function obeys uh, this sort of uh, wave equation, but with a point source. So, there is a point source at x dash. So, the bottom line is that in all these cases, so the prescription is that you first solve for the Green's function of for a point source and then you use it to construct your solution for any other source. So, now let me uh, come to something uh, uh, very basic which, uh, which seems quite obvious, but I think it is worth pointing out uh, nevertheless. And that is, uh, suppose you are in, uh, you are talking about electrostatics. So, therefore, the uh, the operator in question is the um, del squared operator, okay. So, that is the Laplacian. So, the question is uh, what would be the Green's function of the Laplacian? So, this is, so in other words, the answer is G where G obeys del squared G equals Dirac delta. So, we all know what that is right because we know uh, what is the uh, potential. So, what is the physical meaning of this? Basically, it, G is uh, proportional to the electric potential produced by a point charge sitting at x dash. Uh, so, the, it is the electric field produced at position x when a point charge is sitting at x dash. So, now we all know what the answer is and that is basically this. So, uh, so what I am going to do is it is one, 1 by x with the appropriate prefactor. So, now I have to convince you that that appropriate prefactor is indeed what I have written there which is minus 1 by 4 pi. And uh, so, that is not uh, entirely obvious because uh, you see Dirac delta is uh, something a, a very peculiar object. So, usually what happens is that if you are not careful if you blindly go ahead and differentiate this with respect to x for example, you del squared uh, take del squared of, uh, of both sides of this you simply get 0 on the right hand side because uh, usually you will subconsciously think x is different from x dash and then everything will cancel out and you will get 0. But so therefore, this, uh, this result is of course correct whenever x is not equal to x dash. But when x is approaching x dash this is not correct so we have to be careful. So, the question is how do you do this carefully? How do you do del squared g carefully? So, the answer is the following. So, uh, you see uh, we do not actually. So, in other words what we do is we note that uh, this is just a shorthand uh, for writing something which is more mathematically rigorous. See what this really means mathematically is that this is f of x dash right del squared g of x minus x dash right d cubed x dash. So, uh, and that is basically 
equal to f of x that is what this means strictly speaking or I mean I had done I have done it the other way. So, um, okay, let me do it the other way. So, basically what I have done is that uh, this equation that is 3.161 is a shorthand for writing this okay d cubed x f of x right del squared g of x minus x dash equals f of x dash. So, that is what this means okay. So, that is the meaning of this okay. So, that is the meaning of this. So, the question is how do you make sense out of. So, in other words I have to really prove this rather than. So, you see proving this is identical to proving this. Proving this is uh, uh, not uh, convenient mainly because you know this Dirac delta has a very precise mathematical meaning which actually really means this. So, in other words any object called delta which obeys this for any f is called the Dirac delta. So, we really should be proving this identity okay. So, now uh, to prove this identity what we do is so I told you that uh, you know if you blindly take del squared g you will get 0, but then uh, there it there is a hidden assumption that x dash is not equal to x. So, now you imagine some region also you are you see here you are supposed to integrate over all space. So, imagine you have a, a coordinate system here okay. So, uh, let me write this uh, coordinate system. Uh, so, imagine you have a coordinate system and this is your x dash and you imagine uh, you have separated out a small sphere out. So, there is a small sphere of radius epsilon around x dash and the rest. So, so bottom line is that while doing this you are supposed to integrate over all space right. So, you are supposed to integrate over all space is not it. So, so this is what we want to prove. So, you are supposed to integrate over all space, but then I am going to split this up into uh, two regions. One is region 1 where uh, the uh, x is not equal to x dash right. So, in other words, uh, so, uh, so, it, so that region is outside the sphere. So, it is outside the small sphere where x can never be equal to x dash, but then there is another region which I call omega epsilon region which is inside this. And that region allows for uh, x to become uh, arbitrarily close to x dash. So, now in, in the first region where x, uh, x dash is always uh, inside the sphere, so it is not uh, all the x, x points are outside the sphere and x dash is inside the sphere. So, x and x dash will never touch each other. So, because they will not, never touch each other del square g is anyway 0. So, so I do not have to consider that. So, that is anyway 0. So, so, this is basically same as saying this. So, I just want to impress upon you that uh, doing this is same as doing this right. So, I, instead of integrating over all space, I simply integrate over this uh, over this small sphere of radius epsilon okay. So, that is sufficient because outside the sphere anyway it is 0. We just verified that by brute force by just taking del squared. So, now the question is how do you verify this? So, so once you verify this you are done. So, that means by definition uh, del square g is uh, Dirac delta. So, if you can show this then it is obvious that del square g is Dirac delta. So, how do you show this? So, for showing this uh, first we assume that f of x is very smooth. So, if f, f of x is smooth then I can uh, there is a something called the mean value theorem of integral calculus which tells you that you can replace. Uh, so, if you have a smooth function under the integrand and you are integrating between some limits, the, there will always be some point within those limits uh, where the uh, you know you can pull out that uh, you can substitute the value of x for that particular intermediate value and pull it out and it will still be correct. So, that is the mean value theorem of integral calculus. So, and because the those uh, See x, x is arbitrarily close to x dash because it is inside this omega epsilon. I will uh, simply replace x by x dash for inside f of x because you see f of x is smooth uh, right. So, only in f of x I can do that because f of x is smooth. So, if f of x smooth means infinitely many times differentiable. So, I can always replace x by x dash and pull it out of the integration 
and then you get this uh, this result. So the so in other words, this uh, this integration, the left hand side is basically same as this because I just approximated f of x. It's not really an approximation; it becomes exact as epsilon tends to zero. So now all I have to do is I have to integrate uh, this uh, over ep omega epsilon. But fortunately, see the reason why I chose chose a small sphere is because spheres are nice to integrate with. I could have chosen a cube or something more complicated, but that would have made my life unnecessarily complicated. So, I simply chose a sphere because uh, that is the most convenient thing to do. So, now if, if I use the sphere, then I can use my Gauss's theorem and uh, I can replace, uh, you know, the volume integral of del squared is a uh, normal uh, component of the surface integral, right. So, so basically or rather, uh, so, it's, it, this is something like divergence of uh, uh, some, some other quantity, right? So, some other quantity f. So, uh, del cube r over omega epsilon is basically the normal component of f, right, uh, over that surface. So, what is f? f itself is, f itself is uh, del of g where g is your Green's function. So, then it is del dot del g that is del squared g, right. So, that is what. So, imagine del of g is f vector. So, then you get basically th this is nothing but volume integral of divergence of f. So, divergence volume integral of divergence of s from Gauss's theorem is surface integral of the normal component. So, if you do that, then you see all you have to do is uh, find the gradient of uh, so, that is your f of uh, capital R is x minus x dash. So, you just have to find, uh, so you shift your coordinates so that x dash is uh, a constant. So, I can shift, uh, I can write as small letter x as uh, x dash plus r and then my d cubed x will be basically uh, d cubed r because x dash is constant uh, when I am integrating. So, then uh, I will simply be able to do this. So, then this is nothing but the uh, de just the scalar derivative now because uh, g of r is just minus 1 by 4 pi. So, then g of r is nothing but minus 1 by 4 pi into 1 by r that is all. So, then uh, it is d by dr of g of r. So, then you simply uh, ju just go ahead and integrate because now you know how to integrate. So, so the sphere is basically if it has fixed radius, so it is d omega into r squared. R is fixed, so so you just it's r squared into d omega into uh, one by four pi r squared because that is what uh, r r hat dot grad g is. It's one by four pi r squared. But then r squared r squared will cancel. Integral d omega is also four pi, so four pi four pi will also cancel, and you get f of x dash. So bottom line is that that uh, completes the proof. In other words. What we have succeeded, so you might be wondering what it is I am doing. Uh, uh, so, uh, basically I am just trying to show you that if I take del squared of this, I really will get Dirac delta not 0 because you see if you do not do this carefully, if you take del squared of uh, 3.160 on both sides in a very naive and uh, not so careful way, you will simply get 0, you will not get Dirac delta. So, I have carefully showed you that if I take del squared of g where g is defined to be minus 1 by 4 pi not anything else minus 1 by 4 pi into x minus x dash magnitude. If I take del squared of this g, I in fact get Dirac delta x minus x dash not 0 and that is not that easy to prove. It is easy to prove it is 0, but then 0 is the wrong answer when x is uh, can be equal to x dash. If x can never be equal to x dash, then 0 is the right answer. But then there are many situations where x is as close to x dash as you want. So, in which case you have to be careful. So, that is why you have to carefully prove that it is actually Dirac delta of x minus x dash and not anything else. So, to prove that you have to do all this, okay. So, so therefore, it is only with that minus 1 by 4 pi prefactor it is uh, because with any other prefactor del square g is still 0 when x is not equal to x dash. But then that minus 1 by 4 pi is very crucial if you want to get Dirac delta and not some uh, you know minus 1 by 4 pi into Dirac delta or some constant into Dirac delta. So, it is really minus 1 by 4 pi and not anything else, okay. 
so but then uh, this uh, this is of course a very mathematically strict way of doing things but you can do uh, do it more easily but with less rigor by using fourier transforms so basically you fourier analyze your g of r and you simply uh, invert the fourier transform and uh, so i'll allow you to read this so you just uh, do it so the reason why it is not uh, so rigorous is because it has a 1 by q squared and you are just integrating over q without uh, so this uh, these types of integrals are not mathematically well defined because you are integrant basically um, yeah so i mean so there are all these issues that you have to be careful uh, so but then this will also al allow you to prove the same thing that uh, integral of dx dash del square g f of f of x dash is f of x okay so this is less rigorous but quicker and uh, but whatever it is bottom line is that uh, having done all that you can now uh, uh, convince yourself that the potential function at some other point so if you have a charge distribution in some finite region uh, so that's basically the uh, the potential of that charge distribution some other point is basically the the charges so d cubed x dash into uh, rho of x dash is basically your uh, dq dash so the charge at that location x dash so you just replace that by this and then you add up over all your charges so that's what that is so that's your potential okay so this is basically your dq x uh, dq dash d cubed x dash into rho x dash is so rho is charge density so if you multiply by small volume you get a small charge called dq dash so dq dash by x minus x dash is your electric potential produced by dq dash at location x dash and then you add up over all the locations okay so then you get the potential function at some point x so now uh, you can also use this greens function to do something more interesting so till now what we did is fairly straight forward you know you just have a charge distribution in some finite region you want to know what is the electric potential somewhere else but what would be more interesting is many times what happens is that uh, in many problems in electrostatics the charge distributions are not directly given they are indirectly given so by that i mean typically you will be told that there are some charges which are explicitly known but there are other charges which are not explicitly known for example they are known indirectly in what way you just specify that there is some conductor sitting in in some space so there is a conductor of a certain shape maybe like a spherical conductor so what you are told therefore is that that conductor for example is grounded so that means you are told that uh, that region of space has a constant potential equal to 0 so where the conductor is located the potential is constant and the and zero and that whole thing region is a sphere so that indirectly implies that there are charge distributions sitting on the conductor which are not specified okay but then what is specified is it's uh, you are told that the potential function is zero so now uh, you want to find the electric potential somewhere else so typically you have, so this is the problem description you you could have a bunch of charges sitting here okay dot 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 but you can also have bunches of charges sitting on on the surface which you are not told what they are but you are told that this is uh, grounded so that means this potential is uh, potential or phi equals 0 so on the surface it's zero so now you want to know what is the potential somewhere outside this conductor so then uh, so the question is how do you answer such questions so to answer such questions you uh, there is a very powerful technique and that's called the image method so what you do is basically you replace this problem by so the point is the difficulty here is that you don't have uh, any means of uh, modeling the conductor because you don't know what charges are sitting here so what you do is that you just say that as far as the point outside is concerned it only cares about the fact that the potential here is zero so you see the moment you uh, firstly there is a theorem which says that the solution of a poisson equation is basically unique right so the point is if you find a solution it is also the solution so the point is that uh, to find a solution all we have to do is you have to uh, simulate this conductor so in other words what we do is we replace this conductor 
and we pretend that there are some charges here. So, we re replace this conductor by some, some charges which are called image charges. Okay. So, we will put a bunch of charges here however many we require, but then uh, we say that this now this conductor is not there. Okay. So, now we are going to say this conductor is not there. So, instead of the conductor there are these charges okay, instead of not in addition to instead of. Okay. So, the conductor is simply not there, but this method will be wrong if you also try to answer what happens inside the conductor because inside the conductor answer is already given the potential function is 0 right inside the conductor and on the surface it is 0. You do not need an answer inside the conductor. We just want to know what it is outside. So, to know what is outside what we do is we write a bunch of charges in such a way that all the, these outside given charges and the charges that we have imagined put together will conspire in such a way that the uh, they will make sure that the potential on the surface is actually 0 and those are called the image charges. So, you can always uh, in fact, you can convince yourself that it is always possible to find image charges though they can be complicated, but they will always be they will always exist you can always find them. So, that is the bottom line. So, this is just a mathematical description of that procedure. So, what we do is that we assume that uh, exterior to the uh, conductor there are known charges these are known charges. Uh, so, somebody has told you what those charges outside are, but, uh, but then, uh, then somebody also says that there are there is a conductor and uh, the on the surface of the conductor the potential function is uh, say phi naught need not be 0 it can be you can put a battery there and make it phi naught. So, if that is the case then uh, what we do is uh, so we replace the conductor by these are called image charges I m stands for image. So, basically we replace by image charges and then and this is uh, x of u v is the parameterization of the surface of the conductor. So, you parameterize the surface of the conductor and then the bottom line is that you solve for this. So, this in this equation indirectly uh, specifies what this is. So, if you invert this equation, so if you invert 3.178 because left hand side is known which is phi 0 which is a constant, you can invert this uh, which might be very hard I told you it is not at all easy and you could invert this and find uh, rho of I m which is the charge density of the image charge. Okay. So, this is uh, the general prescription. So, you can work out uh, standard uh, questions like this. So, if you have a sphere which is grounded and there is a charge q outside what is the electric potential somewhere there. So, for that you have to it is sufficient to introduce one image charge. So, th so, you replace the conductor by this image charge and this already existing charge and you can convince yourself that these two put together will ensure that uh, the potential on all the points on this circle are 0. Okay. So, that will be the case if you ensure that the charge is sitting at A squared by L where A is the radius of the sphere and L is the distance from the center of the sphere to this other charge outside charge. Okay. And then uh, you make sure the image charge is uh, negative compared to the outside charge, but the magnitude is uh, different. So, it is uh, its magnitude is A by L times the charge that is sitting outside. So, if these two conditions are met this is uh, going to produce the right answer. So, these two charges put together will produce a potential outside somewhere to be this. So, outside it will be this. Okay, so, so, this is the image method. So, now what I am going to do is I am going to uh, discuss another technique. Okay. I am going to discuss uh, a, a more general version of this image method. Okay. So, so, what I am going to do is I am going to discuss a more general version of this image method which basically uses uh, what is called Green's theorem. So, the Green's theorem uh, is going to be a very powerful tool in our analysis. So, basically, so what I am going to discuss now is just the is just the mathematically formal way of describing the image method. So, the bottom line is this that we use this theorem this, this is a mathematics theorem. So, if phi and v are some functions and suppose you want to calculate something like this. 
So, you might as well calculate this instead. So, that is what the theorem says. So, if you want to calculate the volume integral of uh, phi into del square uh, del squared v minus v into del squared phi that is same as calculating the surface integral where the surface is the surface bounding this omega right of uh, phi into the normal uh, gradient of v minus v into normal gradient of so I missed a del there normal gradient of phi ok. So, now what I am going to do is uh, so, I am going to imagine right imagine a region uh, omega that excludes a point r and the interior of all the conductors. So, for this I have to draw pictures. So, imagine you have a bunch of conductors ok. So, you have a bunch of conductors here and there are a bunch of charges here ok outside somewhere. So, these are actual charges somebody has put them there ok. So, there are a whole bunch of charges somewhere could be all over the place, but it has to be in some finite region and even the conductors have to be in some finite region. So, these are all conductors at various potentials. So, the bottom line is that, uh, so imagine that uh, the omega that you are looking at is uh, this omega outside, outside means they are outside the conductors and uh, outside the, so, so first you, you, you write down your point of interest, you are interested in this point ok. So, you are interested in this uh, point. So, it is also outside this. So, that means your omega is here. So, it is outside uh, this point of interest and it is also outside the conductors ok. So, that is what this is. So, imagine omega excludes both the points r and it excludes the interior of the conductors ok. So, the boundary of this uh, region, so, the, so this is the region. So, the boundary of this region will be two disjoint pieces one is a small spherical surface of radius epsilon this one. So, this is a small spherical surface of radius epsilon centered at r ok. So, that omega is outside the sphere and it is also the boundaries are the, these are the boundaries. So, there are many many boundaries of this omega out. So, it is this this is one boundary, this is one boundary, this one boundary, but notice that this is not a conductor, this is our small imaginary epsilon sphere. These are all conductors, all, all potentials at all these points are constant, but here it, they need not be constant ok. So, now I am going to since this is valid, this uh, Green's theorem is valid. So, this 83.184 is called Green's theorem ok. So, this Green's theorem is valid for any phi and v. So, specifically I am going to select v to be minus 1 by 4 pi uh, mod of r, r dash minus r because I know that that corresponds to a point charge. So, now notice that since uh, r dash, so the r dash is uh, so, uh, the point inside omega, but notice that omega excludes r right. So, uh, there is no chance that uh, omega that means r dash and r can never be close to each other because uh, r dash is outside uh, that sphere small sphere of radius epsilon where r is located at the center whereas yeah r is at the center of that small sphere. So, r dash is outside that small sphere. So, there is no chance that r dash and r will come very close because there will always be minimum distance epsilon from each other. So, if that is the case then del squared v is uh, 0 because uh, they will never come close to each other. So, del squared v is 0. But then del squared phi is of course, uh, minus 4 pi uh, rho because uh, that is what we expect. In region omega we expect del squared phi to be uh, uh, obeying Poisson equation ok. So, that is the bottom line. So, th you see that this is uh, this is 0 and this is uh, your uh, Poisson equation right. So, this is what that is ok. So, therefore, uh, this left hand side will basically become this because this is 0 and this is uh, minus 4 pi rho ok. So, that is what that is, but then uh, this will uh, so this will now split up into many portions. One is the so I told you this this s s is what the, it is the surface of the boundary of this omega outside. So, omega outside has many many boundaries they are all in the shape of spheres at least they are oval shaped. This is a perfect sphere which is uh, 
basically of radius epsilon tiny sphere of radius epsilon which is very tiny it tends to 0. But these are actual huge conductors but these need not be spheres they can be some irregular shape also. But bottom line is that you have all these boundaries. So, you have these conductor boundaries which I have called S conductors which correspond to the shapes of the different conductors which I have separate, uh, separated out like this. But then there is this S of epsilon which is the boundary of the small sphere uh, which is sitting uh, with center uh, at R. So, we can actually evaluate this at least. This is of course difficult because you have to know what those conductors are. So, if uh, no further information is given you cannot proceed beyond this. So, this S conductors can be the basically is the boundary of all those uh, lots of conductors which are sitting somewhere. So, you cannot uh, simplify further if you do not know what they are. So, we leave that as it is ok. So, this 3.185 S conductors integral we cannot simplify further. But the next one we can simplify further and how do you simplify it? See you simplify it by noting that first of all you again as usual you make this uh, this this thing that r dash you write as uh, r plus r ok. So, and your r r is basically this this r is on the surface of that small sphere of radius epsilon. So, if that is a small sphere then what is uh, d a it is basically 4 pi epsilon not I mean 4 pi epsilon square epsilon is your uh, small radius ok. So, epsilon is the radius of the small sphere and uh, area is basically. So, there is no question of integration because so you basically again use mean value theorem because phi is smooth. So, you approximate it by phi of r and then uh, you see this what is v? v is basically minus 1 by 4 pi r. So, the uh, dv by dn is basically dv by dr. So, so, if you do dv by dr you will get plus 1 by 4 pi r square, but r is epsilon r is the radius means uh, r, r is that uh, thing that is sitting on the surface of the sphere vector. So, it is 1 by 4 pi epsilon squared because of this and it is uh, d a is also 4 pi r squared r means epsilon. So, it is uh, 4 pi uh, epsilon squared and this is 1 by 4 pi epsilon squared. So, and uh, they will cancel out ok. So, they will cancel out because uh, and there is a minus sign because basically uh, you are talking about the inward normal to the spherical surface because notice that the normal component is out uh, look you have to in you have to look at the outward normal to the volume which is inward normal to this sphere ok. The volume in question is this one. So, the outward normal to the volume is inside the conductor like this inside the sphere like this. So, the outward volume uh, outward normal to the volume that you are interested in volume is the intermediate spaces between the conductors and the sphere. So, the outward volume to that is the inward normal into the uh, small sphere. So, because of that there is a minus sign ok. Right. So, having done that you can uh, easily convince yourself and this this other term is uh, negligibly small because uh, uh, this is uh, this is of course of uh, some uh, constant value, but uh, whereas this is minus 1 by. Uh, so, basically this is minus 1 by 4 pi r, r is epsilon and but then this d a is 4 pi epsilon squared. So, epsilon squared by epsilon tends to 0. So, this term does not contribute as epsilon tends to 0 only this contributes. So, bottom line is after all that effort this whole thing becomes phi of r ok. So, that is the point. So, this, this becomes phi of r and this one was already that. So, then you can take that out and then finally, you can write this. This is a very beautiful formula. So, what this says is that if you have a whole bunch of conductors and you have a whole bunch of charges described by this charge distribution the potential at any point r is basically given by the usual coulomb potential due to the charges, but it there are also uh, contributions from the charges sitting on the surfaces of the conductors which are not given explicitly. But if you know the, uh, so this v of r of course continues to be keep in mind what that is, this is 4 pi x minus x dash with a minus sign. So, that v 
but then if somebody tells so this you have to integrate over the surface of the conductor so somebody has to tell you what the phi's are at the surface and somebody has to also tell you what are the shapes of the conductors so if somebody tells you the shapes of the conductor so uh, and you, they tell you what is the potential not only they tell you the potential on the surface of the conductor they should also tell you the gradient so that means they have to tell you the the normal component of the gradient so basically they have to tell you what is the electric field the electric potential and the electric field on the surface because the electric potential is so the electric field is the derivative so the function and its derivative both have to be specified okay not just the function see the value of the function at some point does not tell you what the derivative of the function is at that point right so you have to specify both you have to specify the potential function on the surface and the gradient of the potential function also on the surface so knowing one does not imply knowing the other both are independent okay so having specified both then you can go ahead and find the so so this is a very general method called green's function method uses using green's theorem so this it's green's function because you see this v is the green's function of the laplacian which is what you get in electrostatics so this green's function method is very powerful because it tells you the potential at any point when the whole bunch of charges rho of r sitting somewhere whole bunch of conductors doing their own thing and then you want to find the potential somewhere outside the conductors inside the conductor is obvious because it's whatever that potential is means if the potential on the surface of the conductor is some phi not inside also it is phi not so that's not interesting it's only outside all those conductors we have to know right so that is given by this sensor so it's remarkable that such a general problem statement has such a closed answer see say so there's a general problem statement a whole bunch of conductors doing their own thing a whole bunch of charge distributions charges sitting somewhere doing their own thing i want to find the potential somewhere the answer is 3.188 remarkable that you can actually write down the answer like that but of course the catch is that uh, doing that integral over the conductor surfaces can be a pain because those conductors can be of you know some irregular shape and all that okay uh so i'm going to um skip the next section which is basically the solution of the uh, wave equation uh, when you have uh, point sources right due to moving charges so that means if you have a point electrical electric charge that's moving in some some arbitrary way so it could be relativistically moving means it can be moving close to speed of light and so on and so forth so so being able to find the electric field produced by a moving charge moving in some complicated general way so that is an interesting problem but uh, it is also a kind of a, a peculiar question which is of limited interest it doesn't have a very general application it is interesting for its own sake not because it really leads to any any larger insights so as a result i am uh, not going to spend too much time on that i'm going to skip this all together so those of you are interested can look it up okay so it's rather lengthy the derivation and all that so what is more generally applicable and important is basically diffraction theory so diffraction theory is very similar to this green's function electrostatic problem except that instead of laplacian you were doing de almersian there is a wave equation we are not going to be solving the uh, poisson equation which is basically uh, the laplace equation with a source see what is poisson equation is a laplace equation with a source so similarly uh, in diffraction theory what we are going to be solving is uh, the uh, wave equation with a source okay so i want to spend do proper justice to this subject so i'm going to stop here and in the next class we will start discussing the, the rigorous theory of diffraction so diffraction of electromagnetic waves specifically light i mean what we normally think of diffraction of light so you see uh, bottom line is that uh, 
in many optics textbooks uh, diffraction is presented uh, in, from a historical viewpoint where you know you have this uh, Huygens uh, experiment, Young's description and so the, there is uh, then it, it leads up to Fraunhofer's theory and so on. So there is all kinds of uh, Fermat's uh, theory of you know, so the whole whole bunch of historical developments which are presented uh, and they all seem very haphazard and unrelated. So whereas my treatment is going to be very reductionist in the sense that I am going to think of diffraction as a natural and immediate consequence of electromagnetic wave propagation because that is of course the distilled final answer to that question, uh, the age old question of uh, you know what is the nature of light and how does it behave in the presence of matter and so on. So this is the question that bothered the great thinkers of antiquity starting from Newton and uh, you know his uh, contemporaries like Huygens and so on. So bottom line is that uh, the electromagnetic description of diffraction theory is really the final answer, I mean it is the final word on the subject because that tells you the correct way in which a light has to be described. Uh, you know as a wave. So I am going to stop here and uh, in the next class I will start diffraction theory, okay thank you. Mm -hmm.